Hello, happy International Women's Day. Um, I wanted to do something slightly different this year and I decided to do a little reading from my book, Bells, which you can buy um, online. I'm guessing bookshops are not really open where you are. And this extract that I want to read to you is about Emily Roebling, who was this incredible woman who basically became an engineer because circumstances demanded it. And this was um, back in the 19th century when women were still considered not to be as evolved as men and therefore they couldn't be as intelligent as men, which um, hopefully we know is, is not true. So I'm just going to read um, a little bit of my book and I hope you enjoy it. Work on the Brooklyn Bridge began in 1869, but disaster struck almost immediately. An accident on site left John Roebling with tetanus and he died a few weeks later without ever seeing the first stone of his spectacular structure laid and Sir John Roebling was Emily Roebling's father-in-law. Washington Roebling was the natural successor to his father and he took on the role of chief engineer to the project. To sink the piers for the bridge he made use of caissons that had caught his imagination in Europe but they were larger than any that had been used before and he was also going much deeper underwater. With layers of heavy stone on the lid, he drove two huge chambers, each 50 meters wide by 30 meters long into the river, one on the New York side and another on the Brooklyn side. While this looked to be a reasonable engineering decision on paper, reality soon sank in. During the first month of excavation, progress was so slow that the engineers questioned whether they should give up and start again with a different approach. As columns as of black smoke emanated from steam engines and tar barrels, tools and stacks of stone and sand cluttered the site, reports began to surface from the workers about what it was like to be in the caisson. It was incredibly loud in the restricted space and shadows darted everywhere. The pressure affected the workers' pulses and made their voices faint. Every internal surface of the huge chamber was covered in slimy mud, the air was humid and warm. As the ground became more difficult to work with, constantly throwing up boulders through which the caisson couldn't cut through, Roebling began experimenting with explosives. He was worried about the quality of the air and how his design would affect his workers, not knowing at the time that his own health would be ruined. Over the next few months, having spent hours deep below the surface, Washington suffered exhaustion, temporary paralysis and a deep pain in his joints and muscles. He had even hired a doctor to be on hand to supervise the condition of the men working in the Brooklyn caisson, which was deeper than the New York one. Without a full understanding of the health issues that he and his workers were facing, Washington shrugged off his symptoms and continued working. Even though the pain was temporary, the feeling of numbness in his extremities was not. He became a victim of caisson disease, in which nitrogen is released into the blood Calling, causing acute pain and even paralysis or death. Now, of course, we understand the dangers of moving from high to low pressure environments too quickly. Divers, for example, ascend at a rigorously controlled rate so that the gas can be expelled. In 1870, however, caissons were a relatively new innovation. Although the engineers knew something about the dangers of working at depth, they had yet to determine the mechanism for avoiding injury. Washington was in constant pain, his stomach in his joints and his limbs, and severely depressed. Ravaged by headaches, he was losing his eyesight and was upset by the slightest noise. But only he had the knowledge and the ability to oversee the project and in his father's place. Nevertheless, Washington's physical condition made it impossible for him to be actively involved. Even normal day-to-day -day tasks were now a struggle. His mental state left him loath to speaking to anyone else except Emily. It seemed as though all the years of design and planning that the Roeblings had put into the bridge and all the personal sacrifice they had endured were going to count for nothing. Emily, however, had spent a long time with her husband and father-in-law hearing about bridge design and engineering and even helping with the technical research. Slowly, she began to get involved. It was, however, a huge step. The idea of a woman being involved in the project, and perhaps even leading it, was unprecedented. Apart from the doubts and mistrust everyone would likely feel for Emily, from the builders on site to the investors, 
did she herself have the confidence to resolve and act as a liaison between her husband and the site, let alone take over the role as chief engineer? With some background in science, but no detailed knowledge of bridge design, Emily began by taking extensive notes from her husband. She feared that he would not live to see the bridge completed. She then took over all correspondence on her husband's behalf, regularly writing to the offices of the, country, of the company. With unwavering focus, she started to study complex mathematics and material engineering, learning about steel strength, cable analysis, and construction, calculating catenary curves, and gaining a thorough grasp of the technical aspects of the project. Emily was determined to see her family's legacy built. She soon realized that these skills alone were not enough for her to successfully lead the project. She had to communicate with the workers on site and the powerful stakeholders. So she began visiting site every day, instructing the laborers on their work and answering their questions. She supervised the build and relayed messages between her husband and the other engineers working on the project. As Emily grew in confidence, she relied on Washington less and less. Her gut instincts guided her decisions and her blossoming skills helped her to anticipate problems before they happened. Records of all work on site and responses to letters were diligently filed and she tactfully represented her husband at meetings and social events. When bridge officials, laborers and contractors visited looking for her husband, she intercepted, answering their questions with authority and confidence. Most of them left satisfied and many of them addressed all future correspondence to her. And in their minds, she became the true authority. Yet Emily conducted her work in Washington's name. Rumors circulated that she was the actual chief engineer and the real force behind the bridge. News outlets made oblique references to her. The New York Star commented archly about a clever lady whose style and calligraphy are already familiar to the office of the Brooklyn Bridge. During the entire period of construction, the Roblings kept their home life strictly private. No magazines or newspapers were permitted to interview them. Despite Emily's careful handling of the project, problems began to proliferate. Costs mounted. 20 men died from accidents and the caisson disease. Washington's health showed no sign of improvement. The so-called Miller suit had been filed. Warehouse owner Abraham Miller sued the cities in charge of the bridge, demanding that they remove the structure in its entirety, claiming that it would divert trade to Philadelphia, challenging the city's ability to fund the project and presenting a number of shipmasters, shipbuilders and engineers who would testify against the safety of the steel cables used in the bridge. Only the determined efforts of Senator Henry Murphy, a longtime supporter of Washington's father, led to the suit finally being settled. In 1882, despite Emily's skillful and assured work on behalf of her husband, the mayor of Brooklyn decided to replace Washington Roebling as chief engineer on the basis of physical incapacity. He passed a motion with the board of trustees to dismiss Roebling, calling for a vote at their subsequent meeting. After much argument, political wrangling and reporting in the press, they gathered, debated and cast their ballots. By a majority of just three votes, the men decided to let Washington Roebling continue running the project until its completion. Nearly, a half -time, nearly half a lifetime later, when Roebling was asked what part Emily had played in building the bridge, he answered her remarkable talent as a peacemaker among the di divisive personalities involved in the bridge's construction. I like to think of her as the polished negotiator, patiently listening to every side of numerous arguments, offering tactful words of caution to the men and smoothing difficulties in a highly charged political atmosphere. Emily was clearly instrumental in ensuring her family's legacy remained intact. So that's just a short part of that chapter. If you'd like to read more, you can read it in my book, Built. And I've also got a podcast episode all about Emily Roebling and the Brooklyn Bridge, which you can find at Building Stories Podcast on any of the platforms that you follow um, or on buildingstoriespodcast.com. 
and I am Roma the Engineer on Twitter and on Instagram and once again wishing you a very happy International Women's Day.